Welcome to Westside, to our online campus. We are truly excited to have you here. Today, we kick off a new series titled Christmas at Westside. We're going to look at the Christmas story in the book of Luke, and I don't know about you, but I love the Christmas season. I know for some it's challenging. Maybe they lost loved ones. Christmas doesn't hold great memories like it does for some of us. But I enjoy even the weather being cooler, even here in South Florida. I I look forward to when we, together as the church, online and in person, are going to have our Christmas Eve service. And I look forward to that as well. And then on Christmas morning, being with my family and celebrating the birth of Christ together. What a fun and joyous time that is. And as we look at this story, as we prepare to do it, I want to ask you this question. I want you just to think about this a moment and reflect on it. What is that prayer that you pray to God more than any other prayer. Maybe it's some deep need that you have, a a struggle maybe in a relationship. You're saying, God, would you restore that relationship? It's a challenge right now. It's difficult. Maybe you have this desire to have children and God's just not giving you that answer yet. Maybe you desire to be married. Maybe you have a wayward child. Maybe you have financial struggles and you're asking God for provision and, and wisdom in navigating that. Maybe it's a health issue with you or a loved one. I don't know what that prayer might be for you, but I want you to reflect on it in a moment and just put that uh, in the front of your mind. And then I want you to think about this for a moment. Uh, imagine that you pray for that, that prayer request, over and over for decades. And you go through most of your life and the whole time, even as you walk with God, God doesn't answer that prayer. Maybe you just feel like he's silent. Well, we have some characters in the Bible, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they can relate to our struggle. And I love looking at the the Bible and the truth of the Bible and the power of God's work in the lives of real people in real history. And how that encourages me as I go through life and I deal with struggles and you deal with struggles. And that we see how great our God is. It gives me hope And it brings me joy. And that's what we celebrate this Christmas season. The great work of our God. Well, Luke was written, as we're going to look at that here in a moment. I want to ask you, go ahead and turn in your Bible right there where you are. Look in your Bible. Look on your device. Luke chapter 1. It's in the New Testament, more than halfway through the Bible. You go to Matthew, Mark, Luke. That's the book we're going to be looking at. And I want to set this story. It takes place 2,000 years ago. And Luke writes this story. He's not one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. But he writes in the book of Luke about the life and the teachings of Jesus, proving that he is divine. He's the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He also writes the book of Acts and how the the church grew. He's a physician that did great missionary work, and his life was put on the line for the kingdom of God. And he wants us to hear this great story. He spent his life trying to communicate it. And so where we find ourselves in the book of Luke As he writes it, he begins right here in Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 5. I'd ask you just to follow along. This is one powerful story. I love this story. This is what it says. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So you begin with this portion of Scripture, and it talks about Herod, king of Judea, being on the throne, kind of in charge of that area of Judea, in charge of the Jews. And who was in charge? Caesar of the whole Roman Empire. So you have these two powerful guys, you're thinking, man, they're the ones in charge. And then God breaks into history and reminds us over and over in the Bible and in our own lives that God's the one really on his throne. He's the true king. And he is not thwarted by anything man and woman, boys or girls, any of us do. God is doing a great work, often in spite of us. And so they have these two characters, a priest named Zechariah, and his wife, Elizabeth. And I love what it shares here, that both of them are righteous people who follow God, and yet they're childless. And this is pretty powerful. Like a priest is allowed to marry uh, any of the other tribes of Israel, but he marries one in the line of Aaron, which is the priestly line. 
And so it's almost like they're doubly set apart for the purposes of God. The priests were to minister before God, to teach the people the word of God, to lead them in sacrifice, uh, to proclaim the truth of them, to lead them in worship. This was the call of the priests. And so here's this guy named Zechariah, his wife Elizabeth. They're living for God, it says. They're following his rules. They have hearts that are surrendered to God. They're obeying God with the way they're living their lives, and yet they're without a child. Now, why does that matter? In that context, in that setting, in that first century, 2,000 years ago, in this Jewish faith, oftentimes this is the way they viewed people. If you are blessed, maybe you, you have a wife and you both live a long life and you're healthy and then you have a bunch of children and you have prosperity, you have prestige, such as being a priest, you must be righteous and God's just blessing you. If you live rightly, you'll be blessed. But if you're not living rightly, maybe you're childless. Maybe you have bad health. Maybe uh, your child has a disability. Maybe you're struggling financially. Whatever it might be, that's kind of how they judge people. So you look at Elizabeth, and you look at Zechariah, and you're going to look at the context of this story, and it appears people dishonor them and judge them. You ever felt that way? Like you're truly trying to live for God, and people misjudge you. I imagine most of us have felt that way at times. So this is the context of the story we begin with. I want to go on to verse 8. It says this, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So there were 24 divisions of the priests in this time in the first century. And at this particular time, here is Zechariah, and his division is on duty. And they would go by lots, and, and, and going by lots, you're choosing a, a stick or whatever, and you're trying to decide, okay, who's the one that's going to get to go and serve as the priest before God in the Holy of Holies, and burn incense, in what represents in the temple the presence of God. They only want in there once a year. And so, Zechariah sovereignly is picked. And the reason they use lots is so that you're not showing favoritism. Maybe the, the high priest isn't, hey, I'm going to pick my best friend, and I'm going to get a kickback from him. No, you go by lots, so ultimately the sovereignty of God's deciding who is the one who's going to be going in there, and it comes to Zechariah. Now, to you and me, it doesn't sound like maybe a lot, but to Zechariah, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That if you're not a priest, you never go into the Holy of Holies that represents where God meets human beings, where His presence is, a holy place to, to have reverence, fear, and the worship of God, the representation of God. And this is like the closest they viewed people ever being to God, and here Zechariah gets that opportunity. He gets this privilege by the sovereignty of God. And so he's going to go in there, and he's going to burn incense, and what a privilege. And you think about this a moment. All the other tribes that are not the priestly line, that are not Levites, they never get this opportunity. And many priests never get this opportunity, but Zechariah is blessed with this opportunity. And so he goes to burn incense before God. Here, here's what I want to do. I want to set this stage with this main point. I want to encourage you with this. I want to encourage me with this. The believe the good news is for you. Good news means gospel. If you've been around the church much, you've probably heard gospel. Like, it's called the gospel of Luke. The good news written by Luke about Jesus. That God loves us. He sent Jesus to come to live a righteous life, to die for us, the Son of God. And he rises from the dead. And if we trust in what Jesus has done, we can become children of God. Jesus made the way. Jesus paid the price. Jesus officer offers us only what he deserves. The inheritance Jesus deserves. That's good news. And what we're to do is believe the good news is for us. The gospel is for us. Oftentimes that's not the way we look at God. We look at God as one who loves to punish, who loves to judge, who puts overbearing demands on us, and yet that's not the truth about who our God is. We're called to believe the good news is for us, for you. And it's not that we can earn our way to God. He gives this freely. We're going to see this in this passage, but I want to challenge you to reflect on that main point. We're going to develop that, and you'll see it within the passage as we go on. Let's go on to verse 11. 
that an angel of the Lord appeared to him. That's not, that's not a small matter. An angel appears to this Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Now, on the right side, it means it represents honor, respect, importance, something that matters. The person on the right side of the king has the ear of the king. And so this represents an instrument of God, even by being on the right side. Verse 12, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. I imagine you're like, yeah, I would be too. Most of us have not seen an angel. But imagine having this holy being, this heavenly being, this supernatural being just appear. And the natural response is fear. And this is important to remember. That there are times when God comes and God speaks to his people through a prophet, through an angel, or other means. And it's judgment and condemnation. He's pointing out, hey, you have sinned. I'm bringing judgment. You better repent. And there is that aspect of our righteous and holy God. And so when Zechariah sees this, something he's never seen before, something he's not in control of, it brings fear, as you might imagine. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you were to call him John. Now, all of a sudden, this angel gives this good news. And I love what he says here. He says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. I tell you what, we go back to the beginning of the message and we think about those things that we're praying about and what is, what is it we pray about the most? Maybe it's about a loved one. Maybe it's about a relationship or our finances or health of us or a loved one or whatever it is that's going on. Maybe our heart has been broken because of life. And we're just praying to God for joy and peace. Whatever it is that we're praying for. Imagine an angel appears to you and says, your prayer has been heard by God Almighty. What kind of peace and joy would that bring? What kind of specialness would you not feel as a child of God? Realizing how much God loves you and he cares about you specifically and your needs. And based on the context what Zechariah had been praying for, and now he's very old. They estimate, scholars do, that he's at least in his 60s, maybe older. And so he's lived all these years, and he's not been blessed with a child. And for them, in that culture, you want to have children, and especially sons, to carry on your name, to carry on your line, to take care of you, honestly, in your old age. And they've not been blessed with that for whatever reason. And he's, imagine, I imagine, been praying for this for decades. And God just kept saying, by circumstances in life, no, or wait. And now an angel appears and says, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son, and you're to name him John. Imagine what you would feel like. And I, I think about, like, this angel coming, and the first thing he says is, hey, don't be afraid. Well, imagine you... you it, experience the coming of an angel to you, you're probably going to be scared, naturally. I don't care how tough you think you are, how much you work out, how healthy you think you are, how spiritual you think you are. You encounter an angel, you will not be arrogant because it represents the presence and the holiness of God. And so often, we have this view of God that's different than the real heart of God. Let's look at this in John 3, 17. And I love this passage. It comes right out of the most famous passage of the Bible. Jesus saying, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his one only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That, man, that's really good news. This is really important what he says here in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come to condemn you and me. Jesus came to save us. So often, that's not our view of God. I don't know about you, but I sit there and I look back even when I was a child, and I remember I was with my brothers. My mom was a teacher. My dad ran a construction business. They, they worked a lot, uh, but they were wonderful parents, still are wonderful parents. And I, I look back at, at a time when we would come home from school, and we lived back in the woods. We had this big house, 
and we had this living room that kind of had a cathedral ceiling, and we'd put up a little Nerf-like basketball hoop, and we would hang it up there. We weren't allowed to. My parents said, don't play ball in the house. I, I, there were three of us, three boys. And you imagine what destruction three boys could do in a house, and yet my parents said, don't do that. And what did we do, sadly? When they weren't around, we did it. And we'd go hang up this little homemade hoop that we had, and we'd go play. And I remember one particular day, mom was still teaching. She wasn't home from school yet. We're playing, and all of a sudden, the ball goes wayward, knocks over a lamp, and breaks it. And you just, fear grips us. And so we run over, we try to fix it, and we feel like, okay, I don't think mom will be able to tell that we broke it. Maybe someday she'll figure it out. Hopefully we're really old by then. No kidding. Um, mom comes home. You know, and what, when we see mom coming up the drive, we, we had about an eighth of a mile drive from the road so we could see mom coming. We'd run, and we would put away the ball and the hoop and all that stuff and then act like we're doing homework or something. I'm just being honest with you. I know it's not right, but I'm admitting what we did. Mom comes home. She walks in the house, and the first thing she says is, who broke my lamp? And we're like, how do mothers have this ability? And this is honestly, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this was the view. It's like, Man, we kind of wanted mom and dad to stay at work so we could go do what we wanted and have fun. Because when mom and dad come, they bring rules. You know what? Now as I'm an adult, been an adult for quite a few years now, decades, I look back, and even just the other day, my parents, uh, they have a house down here in South Florida, and they have a house in Ohio. They're kind of the snowbird kind of people like many people around here are. And they were at our house the other night. And my kids were about to go to bed. We were doing devotions, and I was thanking the Lord for them. And I was thanking my parents that, uh, just, just for my parents, you know, that they stayed together, that they loved us, they taught us the right way. They're not perfect. They weren't perfect then. They're not perfect now, but I'm thankful for them, and I love my relationship. Sometimes we view God like I viewed my parents, that when God steps in, he takes away the fun. When God steps in, he enforces rules. When God steps in, he judges and makes life not fun. And sometimes we view our parents that way as kids. Man, they're just trying to keep me from fun. And sometimes we view God that way. There are people I've shared the good news with, and, and they don't want to trust in God because of the rules. And here's the reality, though. God didn't co come to condemn us. God didn't come to keep us from fun. God came, us, came to us to bring us joy, to bring us eternal life, to bring us the good news, this good news for you and me. And as this angel comes to Zechariah, and for Zechariah and Elizabeth, and this is important really for the whole world, this is good news. It's good what God is bringing. And so he has to tell him, don't fear, I bring you this really good news. Your prayer has been heard. God is working, Zechariah, even when you couldn't see it. God knew what he was going to do, Zechariah. You didn't need to know. But now I'm letting you know, and this is good news. Continue on. I love this passage here that we're in, uh, here in Luke chapter 1. Continue with verse 14. He goes on about this son that he's going to have. He says, he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I, I love what he's doing. He's letting him know, hey, you have a special son. God has this plan for your son that you're going to name John. God has heard your prayer. You prayed for decades for this Zechariah, your wife prayed for this for decades. God has heard your prayer. He was going to bring this to fruition before the foundation of the world. You just didn't know it. Yes, you had to wait decades. Yes, it was hard. Yes, it was difficult. But your God is good. And he's brought you better news than you could ever imagine. You wanted this probably a long time ago, Zechariah. But God is bringing it right now. And he's fulfilling something even greater than you thought. This boy's going to be a joy to you, buddy. He's going to be a delight to you. Many will rejoice because of his birth. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord, and nothing matters more 
than that. He tells him, hey, don't let him drink any fermented drink. And uh, scholars debate what that means because there's a Nazarite vow back in the book of uh, Numbers. There are other things that God may uh, uh, set apart for those things. But God's just saying, hey, this guy's going to be set apart for my purposes. And here's a picture. Like in Ephesians 5, it says, don't get drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. And so he doesn't want him controlled by um, alcohol, and it's not just telling everybody never, ever drink alcohol. That's not the purpose of this passage, but it's saying this boy's set apart. This boy's going to be set apart, and he's going to be following the Spirit of the living God. And what he does is he goes to quote this passage here, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And you can make note of that. We're not going to look at it, because basically what the angel said was those verses. He cited this passage, the angel did. And I want you to step back a moment for you and me. Zechariah would have known the Bible. He would have known that Old Testament. He would have known that prophecy in Malachi 4, we estimate. And so when he's hearing this, he had been waiting and he had been praying probably for decades that he would have a son. And the angel acknowledges, God's heard your prayer. And think about this a moment. He had to wait. But the child that he's going to be given is one that has been prophesied in Scripture centuries ago. That the child he's going to be given is a fulfillment of a prophecy from God Almighty. That his people, the Jews, have been waiting for. He's the promised Elijah. Elijah is that great prophet of God known for doing great miracles and being a spokesperson of great faith for God. He is honored and revered in the Jewish faith. And his son, John, is going to be in the spirit of Elijah. He's going to be known throughout the world, throughout the, 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 the faith of the people of God as one used by God. So God had this plan that even though Zechariah and Elizabeth had to wait, God was going to do something greater than they could imagine and that their son would be a blessing to the world. Think of the contrast of them waiting and yet God fulfilling this. That's really powerful, powerful news. I want to encourage you with this, that you believe the good news is for you. And here's what God wants for Zechariah. He simply wants Zechariah to believe that his God is good. To believe that God has sent this angel to bring this good news. So what is the response of this Zechariah? I bet you can relate to this guy. I can relate to this guy. This is what happens here, verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. That seems like an innocent question, doesn't it? It seems innocent. Like, how can this be? And if you look at the spirit and the context of what's going on, he's almost wanting to say, hey, angel, I need you to go back to God and make note to him because he may have not realized this. I'm really old, and my wife is well along in years. Now think about it for a moment. I imagine he's trying to be careful because this is recorded in Scripture for all time. He's basically saying, hey, dude, my wife is old. Men, be careful of calling your wife old. I promise you that. that you better be careful of that. But he's, he's almost saying to God, hey, you missed some information. I don't know if you realize this. You might have the wrong guy. You might have the wrong couple. We're too old for you to use. You know what? So often... God is coming in to do a supernatural work in your life or mine. And we think God isn't powerful enough to overcome our circumstances. And sadly, that seems to be the response of Zechariah here. I've been there. This is what the guy seems to do. Con continue on here, verse 19. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. It's like uh, Gabriel is letting him know, hey, dude, I'm in the presence of God. I'm speaking the words of God to you, buddy. And what God says, he always fulfills. He's being very authoritative. This is important to understand about this angel. This angel is not divine, but this angel is a heavenly being. This angel is sinless. He's, angel means messenger. And he's a perfect, holy conduit of God. He is not like you and me. He's not like me. He doesn't have that sinful nature like I do. He simply speaks the words of God. He doesn't have his own personal motive. He's not selfish. He's not prideful. He's just speaking what the word of God is, truthfully. 
He's not like us. And he's being authoritative, saying, hey, buddy, I'm in the presence of God. I'm speaking simply what God has said. He's letting Zechariah know, dude, you better be reverential here. You better believe. Verse 20, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So here, here's what this angel does. I imagine he's kind of got an attitude with Zechariah, like, hey, buddy, God has just spoken to you. God has heard your prayer. God is working in your life in powerful ways. God is working in this world in ways you don't even understand, in greater ways than you can conceive, buddy. And when God speaks, it's true. And I'm going to give you another sign, buddy. You're not going to be able to speak. Think about that. He won't be able to speak the good news he's just heard. Why? Because he didn't believe. But I want you to hear this. That even when God gives punishment, it's love. It's love. It's in a couple levels. One is, he's letting Zechariah know, buddy, I'm not going to let you speak. And it's a supernatural work that's keeping you from speaking. That way he knows when, when God speaks, it's true. And here's a sign to you, you won't be able to speak. And that sign is an affirmation that I'm going to do this other thing I said I was going to do. I'm going to give you a son. His name is John. He's the promised Elijah. He's letting him know, I'm going to do this. And on another level, like, like Zechariah, it's going to help you be humble and to learn to believe me and that I've brought this good news to you, buddy. And, and to you and me, it may seem kind of harsh. I'll be honest, maybe I read this and I think, man, that's kind of harsh, God. But it's God, God's love to us, like when you think as a parent, as a grandparent, when you discipline a child, maybe as a teacher or a coach, when you discipline, it's because you care and you want the best for them. How much more for God? He loves us. And yes, he gives Zechariah this consequence, but it doesn't stop God from doing what he promised. Think about that for a moment. Look at what we're going to read here in the next, the next verses, verse 21. Meanwhile... The people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So, in other words, because he didn't believe, God didn't let him communicate this good news. Not verbally, anyway. So he had to use signs to let them know. And it goes on, verse 23. When his time of service was completed, so even though he went and burned incense for a while and then he came out, his time on watch as a priest there at the temple was not over. So he had to continue that service even as a guy who couldn't speak. But imagine the, the sense that, man, God Almighty came to visit me through this angel and God has heard my prayer and God's doing this great work and he showed me a sign that I can't speak and this is going to happen. He goes on. Um... Verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. So he goes home, and I'm not going to go into that, but, you know, husband, wife, and she becomes pregnant. But for five months, she stays in seclusion. Like, why? It doesn't, it doesn't tell us, so we've got to be careful about speculation. But it appears what we're going to see here. Let's read that, that, that last verse. Verse 25, it says this. These are the words of Elizabeth. Verse 25, the Lord has done this for me. I love that picture. The Lord has done this for me. When you're praying and you're waiting for God to answer and he doesn't, it's hard, isn't it? It's a challenge. It's difficult. It can hurt. You can, you can begin to question, does God love me? You wonder, God, do you really care about me? Yeah, God, you took care of Elizabeth and Zechariah. God, you took care of other people in my world that I think are super spiritual. But God, I've been praying for this and praying for this and praying for this. I'm not getting an answer. And then when God comes through in this supernatural way, I, I love that, that statement, the Lord has done this for me. And it's not just about Elizabeth. Because God's going to use this boy to impact the world. 
See, the people of God were promised so long ago through Abraham that they would be blessed. Why? So they would be a blessing to the world. When you're blessed, and when God answers prayers for you, yes, he's showing you he loves you, and he hears your prayers, and you matter to him, and you're special to him, and he loves you so much, his son died for you. Yes, that's true. But he blesses you that he would use you to bless the world. And so I love the words of this woman saying, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And what she's saying here is he's given me grace when I was experiencing disgrace. Right, so here she is and she's like realizing I'm pregnant. Her husband's able somehow through writing or whatever to communicate to her, hey, God said he's going to do this. And then by God's grace, she becomes pregnant. Something they probably prayed for for decades and decades and decades and decades. And based on, on Zechariah and his lack of belief, he probably in his later years stopped praying for it. He thought, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. God must have said no. But all those years later, all those decades later, those prayers that he prayed way back when, decades and decades before, God was answering now, even when he's not believing. That's the grace of God. God's answering his prayer not because he's perfect, not because he believed as deeply as he should have, but because God's just loving and kind and good, and he loves this child of his, Zechariah. And he wants to use this one. He chooses to use him, not because he's so great, but because God's so great. Isn't that encouraging? It encourages me. Because sometimes I feel like Zachariah. I don't have the belief and faith I need to have. And I'm thankful God loves me anyway. That God has saved me anyway. That God would use me anyway. And, and here is this Elizabeth. Here's the Zechariah, and in that first century world for these priests and his wife, this priestly couple, that they're trying to live for God, they're doing what's right, and they're probably being judged and dishonored because they don't have children. They're being looked at as less than. You ever feel that way? They're, they're being looked at as less than, and now God has given this special blessing to them, this favor, this grace is what it means, this gift they didn't deserve. She had been disgraced. She had been dishonored, and now God's going to honor her. And through this, these decades probably of dishonor, this honor is so great it overcomes all of the dishonor. And through Jesus, that's exactly what we receive. Through trusting in Jesus, what we deserve is dishonor because of our disobedience of God. Because our hearts don't live for God. Our hearts are crooked and sinful. And yet, through trusting what Jesus has done, we can have life forever. That is favor. I want to encourage you, our online campus. Maybe you're someone and you don't know this Jesus. You don't have that promise of hope that the one we celebrate at Christmas brings. That he came and he lived, he died, he rose from the dead. And if you trust in him as Savior and Lord, you become a child of God. You will be with him forever and ever. I want to encourage you, nothing more matters at Christmas than that. I want to encourage you to do this. Not some magic words, but just come along with me and just say these words in your heart. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, right now for hearing my prayer. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to save me, to forgive me of all I've done wrong. Jesus, to make me a child of God today, that I will know I'll be with you forever and ever, not because I deserve it, but because you made the way for me through the cross, through the resurrection. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you, if you've done that, go into the chat. Go ahead and make note of that if you would. Uh, let someone know. One of the hosts would love to walk with you on this journey just to help you confidentially. Go ahead and make note of that. Hit that little raise your hand button. We'd really appreciate that. And, and for those of you who are there, you just might need prayer right now. Maybe you're sitting there thinking about your prayer, and your prayer, you don't feel like it has been heard. You're waiting, and you're waiting. Someone would love to pray with you. Just go in the chat. Someone would love to pray with you. And I want to close with this question right here. I want you to reflect on this. What is the most amazing answer to prayer you have ever experienced? And as you look back at that prayer that God answered in your life, maybe even years ago, 
I pray it helps us to give thanks. And to realize the same God that answered this prayer, the biggest prayer of your life, the same God that answered Zachariah and Elizabeth's prayer is the same God working in your world right now. I love this picture that God wants to use us. God used this couple to bring up the son, to usher in the Savior of the world. God is working right now in your life and mine that we'd be instruments of his to impact the world for Jesus. This Christmas season, through COVID and everything, to impact the world for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you don't call us to earn our way to you. You call us to believe the good news is for us. To believe you. And in that, to be in relationship with you. To walk with you. To love you. To serve you. To know you. And to be with you forever. Thank you for that, God. Give us the power of your spirit to believe. And to believe in a way that we truly would live for you. Because you've been so good to us. God, I pray that we don't leave this message feeling like, man, i got to work harder. But that we're just overwhelmed with your love. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.